Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for joining us today for this HashiCorp sponsored presentation. My name is Steve Palomares, and I'm happy to welcome you to today's session. We would like to extend a special thanks to Clover for the content that they have prepared today. We'll introduce that team in just a minute. Today we're going to be talking about multiple HashiCorp products and how these technologies were and are used together as a solution for Clover to reach many goals, which they will share in just a minute. We will be talking about HashiCorp Vault and Terraform. HashiCorp Vault is a market-leading solution that is used to manage secrets and protect sensitive data. HashiCorp Terraform is also a market-leading automation solution that is used to create and manage infrastructure in your data center across VMware and also across any of the cloud providers that you leverage today. The Clover team in just a minute will discuss how they are using Terraform and Vault together to greatly decrease times to create infrastructure. Those times have gone down from days to minutes and will steal any of their thunder. The members of the team that will be speaking, and I'll just uh, announce their names before we get going here in a minute, Richard Whitney, Aaron Levy, Ani Ramesh, and Dusty Gutsman. Just before I pass it to the team, I also wanted to note that this session is being recorded, and the recording will be made available after post-processing, which is usually a few days. It will be emailed out to all of the attendees. The presentation and demo will be about 40 minutes, and then we'll allow up to 15 minutes afterwards for questions. I would just ask that you submit your questions through the Q&A portal inside of ON24. Uh, we'll, we'll look at those, and then we'll queue them up and answer them at the end. Okay, with no further ado, I'll pass it over to the Clover team. Take it away, Richard. All right, so Aaron Levy's going to introduce not only why we selected Vault and Terraform, but give you a little bit of context of why we needed it. So, Aaron? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Aaron Levy, and I'm here to talk about how Clover is helping to unlock a more cloud-native operating model by leveraging both Terraform and Vault. Um, so Clover, uh, for those who are unfamiliar, is a cloud-based point-of-sale provider. It was founded in 2012. Uh, we build custom hardware for merchants to use in running their business, as well as a cloud platform that powers it all. Next slide. Cool. Um, so. Despite being a cloud point of sale provider, uh, we started it with some pretty old school hosting. Uh, we, we ran Clover on bare metal servers in uh, software, now known as IBM Cloud. Uh, and all of our core functionality was powered by this single Java monolith. Uh, we had our infrastructure loosely managed via a Puppet v3 repo on a single Puppet server. Uh, and and we, we had secrets hard-coded into that code base. It was a very sort of, uh, it was a very legacy manual way of man managing infrastructure. Next slide. As part of moving cloudwards, we really needed to upgrade to more modern tooling. And we, we looked at various options in the space, but it quickly became clear that both Terraform and Vault from HashiCorp were the industry leaders. And it really didn't take long to see why. Uh, Vault needed to work very well for us, not only in GCP, but also in our legacy bare metal environments during our transition period. Um, Terraform, uh, you know, on the other hand, had to allow us to provision and manage cloud resources in a declarative manner um, you know, not unlike you know, we were already doing with Puppet, while also enabling a large number of people across the company to contribute to our infrastructure. Uh, next slide. So Terraform, uh, specifically Terraform Enterprise, has been really great for us. 
Um, it's really sort of uh, democratized access to, to making infrastructure changes at Clover. You know, anyone in the company can submit a pull request to our infrastructure code. Uh, and, and it's made our infrastructure engineering team a lot less of a bottleneck. Uh, we used to hear a lot from teams about how, you know, everything is, you know, blocked on infrastructure engineering or blocked on ops. Uh, but now, you know, in, you know, any team can, can take the initiative to contribute. And it's, it's, it's been uh, a night and day transformation for Clover. Uh, we're also leveraging TerraTest to ensure that our infrastructure code changes, just like application code changes, are testable. Something that's really important, especially as we, you know, mature our infrastructure and organization. So Vault, it's hard to really express in words how significantly Vault has leveled up our infrastructure security at Clover. We, we've gone from having 100% static secrets uh, and relying heavily on network trust to supporting both random and dynamic secrets, uh, and as well as a robust PKI solution that ensures that we're trusting specific managed endpoints in, in our production environment, uh, not just the network itself, uh, something that's that's increasingly crucial you know as we, we move cloudwards we also use vault uh you know for you know perhaps a less common use case uh to power our multi-factor authentication uh for engineers ssh chain to servers we leverage vault as an ssh certificate authority uh, and we issue ssh certificates to ub keys uh, in hardware for all engineers with production access um, it's mfa that's easy to use um, and has the security that you can only get with, with hardware-backed uh, solutions. We've also been able to, just like we did with Terraform in our infrastructure, we've also been able to have teams and system owners take, a much, uh, take much more ownership of their own team secrets and their own system secrets and the management of that. Uh, that that's also reduced the extent to which our infrastructure and security and operational teams are the bottleneck. Um, and uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to Richard. All right, thanks, Aaron. So for this next uh, part of the spotlight, what we really wanted to do was, we first wanted to showcase why we selected these tools, but really what's gonna arm everybody here is what use you can get out of Vault and Terraform. And we wanted to highlight the design decisions and the architecture of really what it, it, how we made it, because a lot of it is not necessarily on the HashiCorp site. And it's stuff that you're going to be learning on your own journey and something that you can do to enable your success and probably also avoid some of the mistakes that we actually made along the way. So two years ago, we brought in Terraform. And it wasn't just brought in to solve the fundamental problem of provisioning. Everyone here knows that Terraform is great for doing that and configuring cloud systems. But what we wanted was so much more. We're very greedy here at Clover. And what we wanted was a gateway for our developers. Aaron alluded to this, which is our developers not the infrastructure teams needed to be able to interact with this vast Clover fleet and to be able to contribute. We chose Terraform Enterprise to be that gateway. We selected the private TFE offering because we are in the payment industry and we could not use the Terraform cloud. You would think that we might be a second class citizen just for getting our own security because we had to have the heart within our own boundaries. But I'm actually happy to say, guess what? Private TFE offering is not a second class citizen. We've never felt that way. The HashCorp folks have been absolutely amazing. And our Terraform instance has been able to size up to meet any challenge as we've gone from zero to thousands of servers and managing everything around it. That way we can continue moving forward. Now it hasn't been a complete cakewalk. And we're gonna talk about that. But the interesting thing about it is the tool itself was able to be scaled easily. It was able to be upgraded easily even when we didn't actually upgrade it for a year. And then we spent, oh, we need to create all this process around safely upgrading and creating a snapshot of a new instance. When guess what? 
We upgraded over a year's worth of changes. It worked. There was no outage. It was great. This is what you want out of your infrastructure. Now, we did have some self-inflicted wounds along the way. One of those would be, you know, of course, upgrading. You want to do that regularly, and we're going to be continuing to do that regularly. But another one is we got wounded by our rapid adoption of moving from zero servers to thousands of servers because we decided to map carefully our GCP projects to our Terraform workspaces. And one of those workspaces became very large, 100,000 lines of state file for managing this non-production environment, and things broke down. You couldn't just throw compute at it to keep it running. And it was still working well, but literally we just immediately ran into the problem that the providers started timing out. And we had to spend time in reflection to say, you know what? We actually have to refactor and break this out. Don't skimp on trying to make two large workspaces. You're going to regret it. And also the chain of command and allowing it to sign other teams that you now own this. You are responsible for this workspace and allowing things through. This is a great equalizer. And it allows us to instead move beyond fighting uh, amongst ourselves and working on a workflow that really enables innovation because we really wanted Terraform to be simple to approach because there's so much to do at Clover, so much. And so what we really wanted was our developers and our infrastructure folks to be able to develop core modules that everyone could use to meet their problems. And then what we wanted to do most importantly was just like with our application developers, we had to test in order to enable this innovation and we chose terror grunts, terror tests to do this. That way we could always mark our assumptions of what we were developing with our underlying modules that would be used as the building blocks for this cloud, our journey, and to ensure that when we were adding a new feature that we weren't breaking anything. This was powerful because the Terraform reviewers that had to review these PRs in GitHub could have some expectation that it was tested and that it actually worked because we would push it out to our CI CD processes to also run those tests. And this allowed us to be armed to really quickly get those approvals out. That way we could push it out and people could start using it. This is very useful because then you can do the right thing of version controlling everything and everyone can start self-serving and allow us to push forward. Now, it sounds great in theory, but like with everything, there are some rough edges, and we do want everyone to be aware of that. We felt that we probably modularize too much. And in fact, it has had a cost to some of our innovation. Sure, it allowed us to have some stability, but one of the things that with Terraform that you want is not only simplicity and conformity, but you also need flexibility. That way you can incubate certain changes. So imagine you have, a fleet of 20 servers and you want to test this new feature, yes, you can test it in the lower environment and you're going to do that, but you also sometimes want to have some time for an incubation period in production. And there are, there are some difficulties with Terraform when you're using modules to doing that. So we wanted to be smart and we're still having to rework our own Terraform modules. That way we can arm our developers to be much more flexible because some workspaces where we have simplicity is actually where we're most effective. And where we have this combined monolith of multiple modules, there's much more friction. So be thinking about it when you're developing your journey of enabling your environment and your people to do the right thing. That way you can have change. Another thing is Terra test. We kept mentioning it in terms of testing. Well, if anyone's used uh, Terra test, they know that there's definitely probably some problems with getting other individuals to learn a new language. Everyone's focused on learning uh, the HashiCorp language, HCP, for Terraform. But then you're throwing, oh, you've got to learn Golang to run tests. One of the things that we did is we created containers to create and scaffold tests, but then 
it wasn't enough because we spent a lot of time reverse engineering a lot of the structures into Golang. And it caused a lot of friction because a lot of these uh, developers were having to spend time on busy work. So we looked out and found GJSON, which is a, frame, a library framework that you can use with it. It's a library and it works fabulously well to allow you to really pay attention what's coming out of the output of your modules, pick at it, and not spend time trying to parse it into your structures. That way you can focus on really what matters, which is the, the business logic of ensuring that this change is safe, that this change is gonna do what it needs to do. Because GJSON functions a lot like JQ. And for many people who are techie, they're gonna know, oh yeah, I know JQ, that's not too hard for parsing JSON output. And that's exactly why we chose it, because we want to make this easy and we don't want to overcomplicate it. And with the success that we had with Terraform, we quickly brought in Vault Enterprise. But one of the things with Terraform is, it's a push model. That wasn't gonna cut it though, when we had to scale out. At Clover, we have multiple regions around the world. It's, it's going to be tough having a single unifying cluster out there that developers and teams work together to secure the secrets in a centralized manner. That's one of the benefits of Vault. You have a centralized secret management solution. How do you maintain that when you need to scale out? We chose Vault Enterprise for the one feature that is absolutely phenomenal, which is performance replication. Performance replication allows you to have a centralized cluster in one region, and it can push out the changes to all these other different regions. You don't have to touch them. For the most part, all these engineers on here in our team, they never interact with most of our global regional uh, vault clusters, and instead, everyone's focused upon the primary cluster and then pushing out the configurations around the world. It works well because we're a small team, but we needed that regional basis. That way, if Latin America goes down, Europe is not going to suffer, or the United States is down and everything falls apart. We don't want that. That's what you're getting with Vault Enterprise versus uh, the open source solution. Can you design around that with open source? Certainly. But we had more important things that we had to do, which is why we went with Vault Enterprise. Further, you also get Vault namespaces, which allowed our teams to be entrusted with certain namespaces that they could onboard to meet their needs, their own auth methods, their own secret engines, and more importantly, their own secrets. This allowed them to actually feel like they were contributing to the Vault story and allowed us to push forward with really having an equalizing effect of infrastructure because the goal is to really get these stream teams to actually be able to enjoy the platform and not rely upon the platform team to push any changes out there. So this is why when you start breaking things out with namespaces, you can start considering and saying, let's take the next step and allow our developers to choose the auth methods that make sense in their environment. Because let's be real, whenever you're working with a system out there today. You may not know it, but there is some identity already baked into those systems. And figuring out what that native identity is, is paramount to making it easy for those systems to interact with Vault. You have a sea of auth methods which Vault has that allows it to authenticate in a natural way with your clients. This is powerful because it allows developers to be able to pick which one makes sense to them. And you don't enforce an April secret ID all the time, even though it might work for your vault agents. Instead, you wanna focus, for instance, on the Kubernetes auth method when you're in a Kubernetes environment. Your pods will interact with that. But you might need to use certificates or app roles on some of your bare metal machines. And then people, of course, they don't want to use those. They want to log in with their LDAP credentials. You want to use what makes sense in your environment because if you do and you allow people to do this, we're trying to take the next step of not only governing what identity you have, because that is important, but instead you also want to turn it around and say, where are you coming from? Why should I trust you? And 
working your way away from just uh, simple authorization techniques, but also uh, intermixing it with the authentication. This is useful because then you can put to, uh, be spending more time on cider blocks and creating guardrails around your namespaces and ensuring that you can lint and ensure the overall config of that's going into Vault is actually good because for so many people, you think, oh, I got to hide Vault or otherwise the attackers are gonna get in there when you may not have the visibility as a security engineer out there that people are doing the right thing and an attacker who's in there says, sweet, I'm gonna go ahead and actually take advantage of this flaw in Vault because I will find it. But if he actually sees that you've hardened everything down and you're scanning it, he's not gonna choose Vault as his attack vector. He's gonna choose somewhere else. And that is the benefit of being able to scan everything that goes into Vault and having the flexibility of enabling developers to actually contribute to this. There was a, a word of warning that I wanna end before we start talking about our transition of our legacy infrastructure and our microservices is dynamic secrets. We've heard of them. They're great. They're fabulous. They're a great buzzword. They're actually really hard if you're not native to the cloud. And there are techniques that you can use to take advantage of them because we enjoy them when we have our native systems of our uh, service accounts or IAM roles that we tie to our EC2 instances or our Lambda functions. But a lot of these legacy apps can't take advantage of this because typically they read in a secret and they're expecting that the service has to be restarted. And for large applications or even small applications, milliseconds outages are not ideal to be able to reload secrets. So what do we do? You're gonna have to take either two courses. The first course is to do what everyone would expect, which is to revamp your application to modernize it. That way it dynamically reads in your secrets and it doesn't need to reload. That's the best place, but ultimately the truth is not all app teams have the ability to do it right away. It's a major change. There are options though. One of the things I wanted to highlight is what we did with the, our internal CA and in enabling MTLS across our fleet. We engaged and used the principle that's in Kubernetes microservices of sidecar containers. And we also put them in our VMs. And what we wanted to do was use HAProxy. It would be the front facing interface and would handle MTLS dynamically reloading our vault certificates because it can hot reload and allow our applications to continue to exist untouched, but be able to send it locally on the box dedicated uh, to uh, one area on a port that couldn't access the internet and allow it to participate in MTLS. This was great because it didn't require application changes. But if you're using dynamic secrets, guess what? You're gonna have to come to grips that you have to do that. We're still working on it and I just want everyone here to know it as well. It's not a free lunch. One other thing though about Terraform and Vault, make certain to back up it. These services, they work really well. We haven't had any issues, but there was one small outage that we had with Vault that could have been worse if we hadn't taken both application and infrastructure level backups because one of them got corrupted. But we had the other one and we were able to recover our data and that is absolutely crucial. You can never have enough backups. And also when you have these critical services, you wanna ensure that they're healthy. And more importantly, you wanna be scanning since they are a centralized location for secrets and provisioning and the gateway for your developers, scan them with automated threat detection. That way you're ensuring that nothing bad is happening there because it does have escalated access into the system and as such, it is an attack vector. And if you're watching it, less bad things happen. So I just wanted to leave you off at that, but I'm gonna turn you over to Ani. Thank you, Richard. Um, you move to the next slide. Yep. All right. I'll, I'll go over um, the Terraform and Vault integration with Puppet and legacy infrastructure. Um, when I know a set of nodes are provisioned through Terraform, Terraform invokes an intermediate REST API to register these newly provisioned nodes in closed machine database. 
Here, um, we set properties such as the IP address of the node, the environment that it belongs to, and most importantly, the Puppet role. This Puppet.role tag enables the Puppet agent running on each and every node to pull the right catalog associated with that Puppet role tag from the Puppet master. One of the problems we faced here uh, was the extreme load uh, the Clover Infra API received when provisioning a large number of nodes. And so we had to optimize the Infra REST API and carefully manage and review the number of nodes we added at one single time. But even today, we continue to use this workflow to provision and configure new VM instances on GCP. Uh, next slide, please, Richard. Thank you. Um, at Clover, um, as Richard already spoken, we use Vault as the de facto secret engine and developed our own solution to integrate with Puppet as the community available libraries did not fully meet our requirements. Uh, requirements such as being able to easily look up in multiple hierarchical places for a secret. In Puppet, Hira is the data layer. From here, Hira lookup function can be performed to pull in secrets from Vault. Any lookup that starts with the Vault colon keyword is translated into a REST API that then grabs a secret from Vault. This easy translation enabled us to maintain environmental mapping between Hira and Vault, and also perform a hierarchical search of secrets, starting from the most specific location and moving towards the most common location. We can see a couple of examples here on the slide. V1 Puppet Sandbox 1 Merchant Auth Token Endpoint corresponds to a specific Sandbox 1 environment, and the next one corresponds to um, a broader non-prod level. And finally, search occurs at the most generic or the default level, uh, which is the V1 Puppet default Merchant Auth Token. Also, Puppet servers communicate with Vault through a secure two-step authentication process using short batch tokens in order to retrieve the secrets. Um, I'll hand it over to Dusty next. Awesome. So with uh, legacy infrastructure, as Ani was talking, we have to kind of change our thought process a little bit when going to um, Kubernetes. So there's obvious... Uh, there's obvious advantages to moving to containers and using Kubernetes to manage those containers, but we do have to go through some new thought processes when figuring out how to use Terraform to manage our infrastructure. Uh, namely, what do we consider infrastructure? So we iterated, added some things, moved some things, changed some things, but ultimately would we came, when it came down to it, figuring out what the infrastructure was wasn't super simple, but at Clover we came upon the definition of what every Kubernetes cluster should have, and we put that into a Terraform workspace and modules. Uh, so this list includes, you know, obviously the cluster itself, and in this case, we're using GKE on Google Cloud, uh, but it also contains supporting infrastructure. So uh, things like FileBeat, um, Vault, Wavefront, Laceworks, uh, and Datadog, all of these things are integrated into our cluster via Helm installs, and that's also all managed via Terraform. Um, we also use this cluster manager workspace to add uh, CNRM, so the cloud native resource managers, so we can provision databases via Kubernetes for ephemeral environments. And we also use that to set up our workload identity, so tying a Kubernetes service account to a Google service account. Um, we also do that all with namespaces, um, alerts, and uh, we also use that workspace to configure our proxies, which I'll uh, talk about in a couple more slides. So with all that infrastructure in place um, that is provisioned and managed by Terraform, we can now take our CI CD and throw it in there. So at Clover, we're using Jenkins for our CI and Spinnaker for our CD. Uh, with our, with uh, Jenkins, we're using it for testing, linting, scanning, you know, the actual building and uh, creating our templated Helm charts, uh, in this case, most of our applications are not actually using it as a Helm deployment, but just using Helm as a templating engine. And that's where we can use things such as Helm library charts to dictate uh, what a standard way of deploying a Clover application is. Um, next, you take Spinnaker. Spinnaker will grab those hydrated manifests and deploy those in a more complex pattern, um, you know, with blue, green, um, canaries, and more options in the future as we as we get our uh, as we get more comfortable with this technology. Next slide, please, Richard. So secrets with uh, Kubernetes is a little bit more difficult. 
a um, little bit, little bit uh, more challenging, but also allows us to do things a little bit more secure. Um, so in order to isolate each application's specific secrets, we create a secret engine per app slash team. Um, and as Richard was talking to you earlier, you know, we can kind of isolate it and really take advantage of all those namespaces. So members of that team and then the Kubernetes service account that is authorized um, to that namespace are given the appropriate level of permissions. So it's not open to the world, not anyone can read it, um, but folks on that team or that create that app have permissions to write secrets to there, but the Kubernetes service account can read secrets from there. So currently we are using uh, only the init container method, um, which is, as you can see here uh, in the, the right-hand part of the slide, using annotations to auto-inject uh, all that information. You know, the, the Vault um, Helm chart actually uses a mutating admissions webhook contr um, controller, so it will just look at those annotations and realize that it needs to inject that side, or needs to inject that init container. So that init container uses the appropriate authentication to talk to Vault. Vault can verify that it, it is allowed to do that. Vault then will write the appropriate secrets to that shared volume, and then the container can read from that shared volume, um, the actual application container that is. So Vault does support a sidecar model, um, but that comes with more complexity, knowing when to restart, how to roll out those changes. So thus far, we've only used the init container, um, but we'll probably be exploring the sidecar model in the future as, as our needs dictate. Next slide, please, Richard. So um, this stuff isn't simple. There's a lot of moving parts. There are modules, there's workspaces, there's the applications themselves, there's repos. For the applications, these deployments need to go to different environments, prod, non-prod, staging, et cetera. So trying to figure this all out is not necessarily simple and expecting every person in the company to understand this is just unrealistic. So we've worked through a lot of the big stuff, um, you know, trend, figuring out transit appearing, getting all the base infrastructure in place so that vaults can talk to the Google Kubernetes uh, control plane, but those networks are not peered directly. So transit appearing requires a proxy. Um, you know, we've gone through figuring out the right way to do the init containers versus a sidecar container, but expecting everyone to figure all this stuff out or just like dive in head first is just unrealistic. So having a good paved path for all the software developers is, is just super critical. Um, we found value with Helm library charts. So defining what a namespace is and um, all the app roles and Kubernetes service accounts that are associated with that, with that namespace, um, you know, an application, what, what does an application look like at Clover? You just want to worry about putting your container into Kubernetes, but you don't care about all that extra stuff. You just want uh, a predefined Clover application with your specific code. So we use Helm library charts for a lot of that stuff. We have a pretty extensive Yoban um, generator set up for repositories to template and generate a lot of this stuff. Uh, documentation is super important. Videos are awesome because you can click and through, going through the process and just record yourself and then share that as opposed to have, having to figure out how to write all that up because this stuff changes so fast. Videos are an awesome way to, to deal with that. Um, offering training sessions and office hours were also a awesome way to share the knowledge and get people onboarded. So I think the last important part is that with Kubernetes, things are moving so fast, things change all the time. So solutions today don't last forever. What works right now may not work in six months, might not work in six weeks. So being flexible, reevaluating your decisions and continually improving and maintaining and upgrading uh, will be the only way that you can maintain any success while using Kubernetes and using Vault and Terraform has made that a lot easier for being more agile and being able to move quickly with changes and keeping everyone on board. Thanks, Richard. I think it's back to you, right? Yes. So, and I think that uh, what Dusty was mentioning where things are moving so fast in the community and it's not just uh, Kubernetes, but it's actually also Terraform and Vault as well. And if you really think about how you channel that change, if you have a small group of people like we have on here, we could not have done it ourselves. And the only way to do it is to provide some medium that actually allows people to enact that change. So 
what do you do? I mean, let's talk about Terraform. Terraform, it's uh, built for that collaboration. You build out your infrastructure, you check it into GitHub, everyone sees it, and you handle the state file with care either uh, remotely or in Terraform Enterprise. Problem solved, you have the collaboration. But when you start thinking about Vault with secrets, everyone starts to get very serious and starts to want to close things down. That's kind of the opposite of really the patterns that we've seen emerge really with our cloud providers where identity is the secret, but the secrets themselves, how do we enable everyone else to do it? We can't do it. So you have to have some medium of allowing people to contribute. And the vault binary really does allow you to enact changes, but when you need something done through a CI CD workflow and allowing people to review it, how do you get vault structure out? That way people can be reviewing it, they can be linting it. And the answer is automation. There is the HVAC uh, plugin over here that I highly recommend if you're starting off with Vault. It will allow you to control the entire life cycle of Vault. We had started to take a look at it and we got a lot of inspiration for what we internally developed ourselves to completely manage the entire life cycle. But if you don't want to do that, you want to leverage the Vault binary for most of your actions, but still allow yourself the ability to externalize this configuration. That way, all these attendees on the call can be working together. Rather than separately, you can utilize this vault controller to help you do it. Because one of the things when you start thinking about how you want to be on your vault journey, you want the success of the tool. And the only way you can have this tool be useful is if people are using it. So when you're automating, you want to first start off with that. It's the most critical part of this journey because it's the thing that gets run day to day. And then you want these abilities to quickly allow everyone to see what they're getting because you don't know it yet, but onboarding namespace is an absolutely crucial aspect within Vault Enterprise to really allow teams to really be energetic about using Vault because it allows them to store their own secrets. It allows them to store their own backends and sync uh, their changes as needed from their systems and do what they need to do to solve the fundamental problems within your organization. Because guess what? Everyone here, for the most part, is not in the business of managing secrets. Our job is actually in managing our customers, whether it's airlines or it's in the payment industry. That's your specialty, not managing secrets. Let Vault do it. And so you need to automate it. That way people can move forward. Then you can start working out to these very important but lesser activities that you really want done when you need them very quickly because it allows teams to be able to spin up their own clusters and it allows you to deal with the fact that people will move on and that you have to uh, continually rekey vault with your key holders that way it's safe but allow everyone to participate because you do want those important functions to be satisfied and then you can start dealing with replication and cutting over in a matter of minutes because the DR process in Vault can be quite complex if you let it be. But if you use automation, you can cut over in a matter of seconds, but you have to do it right. And the only way to truly well oil this process is to add automation. You just got to do it and you got to embrace that. And guess what? If you do this right, Vault is going to be as successful a story as Terraform. You heard Aaron mention how Vault was one of our biggest successes, and it is because we weren't content with just leaving it as is. And we wanted to add in something that really allowed our developers and our entire organization to take advantage of Vault. But I, you're probably saying, how do you handle the secrets, Richard? We had this chicken and the egg. This is why I said onboarding namespaces and so important. You can create as part of this a transit engine. It is a specific secret engine that's dedicated to encrypting data that's in transit. That's why it's called the transit engine. If you utilize this feature, you can onboard your own secrets 
into your vault and store it in source control and allow any developer to encrypt a value, and then you can have your privileged CICD system or actors to decrypt it. This allows us to have a single process that everyone's taking advantage of and everyone follows it, that you can encrypt it, anyone can encrypt it, but only privileged systems can push it out there because we don't need to see it. But what we do need to know is where it is, and you can see that clearly if you're storing this in your source control and how I can use it. You can answer it by seeing your auth methods that are in here on the JSON or understanding, okay, the puppet secret engines. Okay, how you organize this is gonna be very important because it allows people to quickly search through this infrastructure as code and it allows you to actually enjoy infrastructure as code with Vault, what a concept. But it's up to you to enable a process that allows them to do this. That way people aren't constantly moving into Vault and manually putting in secrets because that's prone to error. And further, you can ensure that they're doing the right thing because you're able to see what is currently out there. The state is right here. If there's any question, you can reapply it. And guess what? You get to enjoy some amazing things with Vault because you're not worrying about what's in it. You know what's in it, and everyone can follow a common workflow that, guess what, is almost identical to the Terraform workflow which is develop, test, review, obviously add your favorite uh, uh, version control and uh, uh, system service now, whatever you need to approve to get something pushed out, then you launch it, people use it. What's good for Terraform is good for Vault. And when you have a small and understandable workflow, you're going to be able to get developers, you can get application teams, infrastructure teams, and security engineers all together working on the same thing to push your organization forward and get out of the secret management and provisioning, uh, provisioning business and give it over to guess what? HashiCorp, Vault, and Terraform. Because ultimately, like I said, this is not your bread and butter. This allows you to enjoy then as you're launching code over here to the right with Terraform Enterprise, that you're uh, configuring your secrets constantly through your CICD system. And you're constantly able to evaluate what is in there. It's understandable, it's approachable. You can put process around it and everyone is happy because they're moving forward. And this allows you to frankly do what we're doing, which is taking the next step. We're not looking at automation. And instead, what we wanna do is take the next step to leverage dynamic secrets, work on making Terraform, the private instance, more highly available because while we're farther along on this journey than when we started, we're really still quite young with these tools and we're trying to learn from it. I'm sure that there are people on this call that could teach us one or two things about this. But what we're trying to do is push the envelope with HashiCorp Vault and Terraform because we have to. Our merchants are relying upon it because we're constantly trying to innovate. That way they can get their new features and manage their problems. That's the thing that we're in the business of, managing our customers' problems. That way they can manage their own because we're all in it together. And we're in it with HashiCorp because they've been journeying with us with these tools. That way we can continue to shorten our development time and push our innovation out there. Now, we still are investigating other things like incubation periods using Terraform, the rough around the edges. This is where the Terraform CDK comes in. We really would like to have much more conditional logic that makes it easier to develop the Terraform state. That way we can continue to make it easier on not only platform teams, but more importantly, our streamlined teams that are trying to get our products out into production, because that's the most important thing. And if we're having a bottleneck in front of there, it's stopping that innovation. We have a lot of problems, we're hiring. And if you guys think that this is cool, we'd love to have you. But when you think about this mission and the value that you're providing customers in production, you really, really want to do well. And guess what? With HashiCorp and Vault, we're really doing that. And we're so happy that we selected them uh, 
several years ago. And guess what? We never regretted it. And it was the clear choice. So I'm happy that to share this information and we're happy to take questions on our journey. That way, maybe we can uh, learn something from you and you can learn something from us. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Richard, and to the Clover team. Really appreciate the time that you spent preparing this. A, a lot of expertise, obviously, some gotchas and um, other things to look out for when you're building the solution. So um, we did want to allow for questions. If you do have questions, I'll just remind you, you can submit them. Um, submit them on the Q&A inside of the tool. So we'll give a, a minute or two to see if any questions come up. While we're waiting, I did want to just mention that I said this at the beginning. Uh, th this uh, presentation is being recorded and we'll make it available after we just do some, some processing work with it. Uh, the, an email we will, sent, will be sent out for, to everyone who uh, attended and we'll send a link to the recording. Um, definitely, if you like what you hear on a Terraform or Vault, mm -hmm. um, you can obviously go to the HashiCorp.com website and find more information or reach out to any of the folks at HashiCorp that uh, you've talked to in the past or anyone that you know, we can help get you to the right person. So I am uh, not seeing many questions, just some comments. Give a few more minutes. Okay, we did see a question come in. Um, I, I, I did see a question about the deck being available, and um, I think we can make the deck. Well, let, let me ask this to uh, Allison and, and Richard about the deck being available. Obviously, it'll be with the presentation, but. Mm -hmm. um, I'm certain that, that okay? we can make a read-only uh, access. We'll get that out. We can work it out because we definitely really want to help share these processes that we've learned because it's a shared journey, and I'm looking forward to so many of the people on here with their own journeys being put in the spotlight and learn from you because obviously we're trying to learn how to best incubate our changes with the Terraform and uh, using the Terraform CDK, and I'm sure some of you on there probably have just done that. So definitely, we have uh, one question. Okay. Yeah. So do we use Sentinel? Do the answer is absolutely, and I think I forgot to mention this. So one of our things that we have traditionally had a problem with with Terraform is those modules. Remember that they're versioned, controlled, but that you would think that you want to police your versions uh, to ensure that, okay, are you following a valid version? But more to the point, you want to ensure that your code debt doesn't get to too big a tipping point because some people, they'll provision infrastructure and then a year later come back. Well, that's not ideal. You really want the entire workflow to continue being fresh and changes being pushed because you want the conformity of the environment. So what you really want to look and what we're uh, leveraging Sentinel for are two things. First one is to ensure that our modules don't get too old and to start forcing people to upgrade. That way you don't run into the case of having to go from version one to version eight. It could be absolutely horrendous with that much of a major revision. And instead, we really want to say, okay, we're going to start a soft alert, alert the, our reviewers to say, hey guys, you got to deal with this. And then, okay, workspace is locked until you upgrade this. Somebody's got to do this because we can't allow that much code debt in there or otherwise it's going to be more difficult for people behind you got to take that stand the other one is we're working on utilizing cost optimization so we're utilize it's usually a portion of sentinel and obviously what you can do is have soft and hard policies for well we have a current budget out there and terraform enterprise can help us understand what that budget it currently is and what it will become and that we can ensure that 
somebody doesn't, because I read it all the time on Reddit and whatnot, where, oh, we accidentally over-provisioned too large a note, and now we're suffering because we have an unexpected $5,000 bill. You don't want that. And this is where Sentinel can come into play. You can use Sentinel also within Vault to help interrogate at the edges for your IP CIDR blocks using Golang. We're not currently using it, but in one of my previous uh, jobs, we used it, and it works out great. Awesome. Thank you for that. I think we have two more questions here, okay. Richard, as we're getting ready to finish up. So transit engine. So this comes from Matt. So the Vault Transit engine, it's just like any other engine, but its job is primarily just to encrypt values. And you can choose. You can have it be sim uh, symmetric or asymmetric. You can choose the key value. But the, the nice thing about it is the keys are stored within Vault unless you allow them to be exportable. This is where performance replication really comes in handy because those other clusters are going to get them. But why is it so powerful? You can generate keys per secret engine. You can generate keys per uh, the namespace. And you can have these transit engines as part of your onboarding process for vault namespaces and vault clusters. And the nice thing about this is you're able to encrypt secrets that are going into vault. That way you can expose them out into your source control. This is useful because you have the chicken and the egg problem of how do I secure my secrets and how do I know what they are? Because you want, most people want to treat Vault like Terraform. Most people want to treat it like their infrastructure. They want to automate it. But secrets are so sensitive. And by having those keys in there, only Vault can, quote, uh, decrypt it. And what you do is you sign roles, a general role that most people can have, which is to encrypt it. But then you have your privileged actors uh, and your CI/CD systems, which you can be monitoring, that have the ability to decrypt it for, say, your specific secret engine. This is useful because if you have multiple keys out there, if somebody's key or role gets compromised, the transit engine that's assigned to that team and to that team secrets is not. And they can't use the secret engine out there. If you actually look at the code that I have in this deck for the that vault controller, you there are going to be secrets out there. But guess what? You can't even use them because that key is gone. It was an ephemeral uh, Docker container that I used for testing. And so you would have to insert it. Once that key's gone, it's gone. But the nice thing with it being in vault is you can constantly rotate these secrets and use bulk transit engine to re-encrypt all these values, restore them back into your source control. This is how we can sync down changes from vault and then do a mass bulk rekeying of allowing us to ensure that, okay, well, let's have an exercise of assuming that we've been attacked and allow us to rotate it. This is powerful because it really allows you to be secure, but also taking advantage of everything Vault has to solve the age-old problem of how do I get my secrets into Vault? And the answer is Vault. So, um, so okay, uh, last question. With Vault spread around the world, what strategies for unsealing the Vault system? So the strategy that we use is you immediately when you uh, deal with Vault, there are two things. One, you have the auto unseal feature, which if you're not using it, get your HSM or Google KMS or whatever you need to have the auto unseal functionality. If you're not using it with Vault, you're in for pain. You're just it's going to uh, really, really be a bottleneck for your vault key holders. And everyone on here uh, has been talking on this team as a vault key holder, but guess what? They have not had to, but uh, three times, have to unseal a vault cluster. It doesn't happen often because of the auto unseal features that if you allow those keys to be in KMS, it allows vault to be much more resilient during upgrades and during outages. You really want to use it, and if you're not, you're going to ha probably be more dissatisfied with your vault strategy. Now, when we're 
creating our clusters, you're going to get back all the keys. One of the things we, is we leverage first that we get back all the keys unencrypted. And what we do is immediately um, we'll apply the primary configuration with a root token and we turn around and re-encrypt uh, because you want to unseal all those clusters at those times, all the different nodes that will function as your vault front ends, and then turn around, revoke that uh, root token, because you, guess what? You have automation as code. Uh, you have the baseline of what your administrators will need to start onboarding everybody. And then uh, you have with PGP encrypted keys, you send them to your key holders. And that process can be very slick and it works very well. That's why we chose to automate it. That way, uh, Richard, Aaron, Ani, and Dusty don't have to deal with it every single time we want a new cluster because you really want Vault to sprawl worldwide. It does a lot of things, allow it to be useful. <laughs> Oh, yeah, we, we have another have... one coming in. How are we protecting yeah. the Terraform state file? So in general, what we're uh, really attempting to uh, leverage is pulling these things uh, directly from Vault. But when we're talking about the Terraform state files, they're securely put down that very few people actually have access to the state files within Terraform Enterprise. But where we're moving to is rather than having your secrets, because uh, if you mark them as sensitive, one of the things first off is this change in 0 0.14. We're on 0 0.12, but in 0 0.14, if they're sensitive, you're not going to be able to see them very well. It gets really difficult to see your secrets. But what we do is we lock down our Terraform state files in Terraform Enterprise because most people do not need to see what is in those state files. And if they are, something wrong has happened because they're more paying attention to what's already in there. We're externalizing all of our secrets and pulling them as dynamic values to our vault cluster. And the only thing that actually would be stored as secrets within our Terraform state is the April secret IDs that we'd be pushing uh, to Terraform to be able to access the secrets within Vault. Because when you start using secrets and having them within Terraform Enterprise, I hate to ever put a dig on Terraform Enterprise because it's a phenomenal product, but it's read, uh, it's write only. When it comes time, if someone was well-meaning and put sensitive credentials in there, you're not getting them out of uh, Terraform Enterprise. And it can be somewhat uh, difficult of pulling them out short of outputting them into your state and allowing everyone to see them and then you got to rotate them and it becomes a mess you don't want to do that so in general what you really want to do is leverage and utilize an external vault cluster dynamically pull those secrets out that way your teams know what those secrets are they're not forgotten and you have vault protecting your secrets rather than terraform protecting your secrets Hopefully that answers your question. Thank you so much, Richard, and to the entire Clover team. We really, really appreciate taking the time of preparing this information and sharing your journey with mm -hmm. uh, HashiCorp Vault and Terraform. So I think with that, thanks for answering those questions. Thanks again for everybody that attended, and um, we'll have more information out on the recording. But uh, with that, that concludes the session for today. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Have a good one. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.